We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome everyone to this PE session. Thank you for joining us uh, here on site in Katowice and online. I have the pleasure to be moderating this session today and I will give over to Prejemek, our PE co-chair or one of our PE co-chairs present here today who will welcome you officially to this session. Over to Prejemek. Thank you very much Florina. Distinguished participants online and on site in Katowice. Dear colleagues, we wish to sincerely welcome you to this session on the Policy Network on Environment and Digitalization. My name is Przemysław Tipiak from the Chancellery of the Prime Minister, and as a, as a representative of the host country, I have the pleasure to welcome you today as one of the three co-chairs to the PE. The main goal of our work has been to focus on interconnections between environment and digitalization processes, which is becoming more and more up to date and important also in the IGF ecosystem. In addition, we wanted to produce concrete, actionable policy recommendations. As a result of our joint collaboration during the past few months, we have the honor to present you the PE report. A word, on an, on, a word on the organization of the session today. We welcome all participants on site, but invite our guests in the Zoom to also contribute by posting any questions or comments in the chat during the presentation. <clears throat> After the presentation of work stream leads, there will be time for you to express yourselves directly via the raised hand option. From this point, I wish to give our sincere thanks to the Swiss government and the IGF, the UNDESA, for providing the valuable contribution to the PE. And last but not least, I wanted to give big thanks to Ms. Lorena Vespi from, for her excellent coordination of work streams and continuous support in conducting our group meeting. She is also the moderator of, of our today's sessions. I am handing over the floor to you, Florina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prejemek, for your kind words. And now I have the pleasure to welcome two additional um, opening guests and speakers. The first one is sitting um, to my right. It's uh, Mr. Zhuang Zhu, Director of the Division for Sustainable Development at UNDESA. And he will um, give us some words of welcome too. Thank you so much, Zhuang. Over to you. Thank you, co-moderator. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, contributed to this important session. This session connects two defining challenges and opportunities of our time, environmental sustainability and digitalization. I want to take this opportunity to thank, first of all, Switzerland, uh, Poland, and the volunteers for the remarkable work you have done uh, in this critical area. From extreme heat, floods, to forest fires, droughts, storms, raising sea levels, and the loss of biodiversity. We have been experiencing in multiple ways the impact of environmental degradation and climate change. Quoting the UN Secretary General, the report of the IPCC released this past August is a code red for humanity. In his report on our common agenda, the Secretary General again calls for strong global commitments and a declaration of climate emergency, as well as the right to a healthy environment. Digitalization can be a driver of the positive change, contributing to net zero and to a green, inclusive, and decarbonized economy. And our natural commons, as well as our digital commons, should benefit everyone everywhere. So allow me to offer some very brief perspective on how we can help make this happen. First, 
We need the digital tech sector to lead by example. To start with, tech companies can move towards 100% renewable energy to power the digital infrastructure. In fact, a number of them are already starting to shoot away. Second, our investment in digital technology should be climate friendly. An ITU report indicates that digital technology could help reduce the world's carbon emission by about 17%. And third, let us do more to promote smart cities. Among other benefits, digital tools employed in smart city can help reduce congestion, emission, pollution, and force. Let us not underestimate the role of digital government. Digital government plays a central role in promoting green policies and building green infrastructure. And last, advanced sustainable management, protection, and the restoration of natural resources through digitalization, and such as the adaptive use of artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and geospatial solutions, and other emerging digital applications. All these and many other issues are being addressed in the policy network on environment, which is just one more initiative launched by the IGF this past year, supported by Switzerland. Like many other IGF participants, I'm very much looking forward to hearing more from you at this session and wishing you continuing success in this innovative initiative. Thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhuang Zhu, for these kind words and for your perspective that we value a lot. And it's also very nice, obviously, to be able to count on the support and the good work that you are doing with your division. So thanks a lot. And you've already um, referred to um, our next speaker, who is Livia Wolpen, who is joining us from Switzerland online today. Livia, you have the floor. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, uh, Florina, and hello, everyone um, from Switzerland. I'm very glad to also briefly welcoming you from the Swiss side um, to this main session of the IGF Policy Network on Environment. Um, at the Swiss government, we consider the interlinkages between digitization and the environment highly important. And of course, um, as we also just heard from um, Mr. Su, the internet and other digital technologies, um, such as, as blockchain or artificial intelligence, they can pose considerable um, challenges to the environment. Uh, for example, in terms of, of energy consumption and e-waste. Um, what we also just um, um, heard during the last days uh, at, at the IGF. But on the other hand, there is also hope um, that digital technologies can help us uh, to protect the environment. Um, for example, through innovations and tools that lead to a more efficient use um, of energy and resources. And I'm actually really glad that the IGF, as the world's leading platform for multi-stakeholder discussions on all aspects um, of digitization, is putting this topic on, on its agenda. And actually already for the second time this year after the first time in uh, 2020. And I'm really convinced that the IGF is ideally placed to discuss environment and digitization and to shed more light on the interplay between these two um, mega trends. And um, the IGF can also really act as a main place for building alliances and networks to address these important challenges. And it was in this context and as a really concrete contribution that we from the Swiss government uh, decided back in um, 2019 to provide some seed funding to this um, IGF policy network on, on the environment. And with this, we, we do hope to, to strengthen the intercessional work uh, between the annual IGF meetings, while at the same time really also contributing to the overall uh, objective of uh, environmental protection. And of course, both goals are also in line with the UN Secretary General's roadmap uh, on digital cooperation. Yes, and now I'm really glad to be here today in this uh, very main session of the Policy Network on Environment and to hear more about the work um, after almost a year and its actions and uh, recommendations. 
And I would also take the opportunity to really thank um, Florina as the coordinator and the IGF secretariat, uh, the Polish government, and of course, all the members of the network and the whole community for their invaluable work. And I also sincerely hope that the work and activities of the policy network will continue and that its um, recommendations will, will really reach the eyes and ears of the decision makers in this area. So I'm really looking forward to hear more about the final report, the recommendations, and um, yeah, to the discussion with you all in this session. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Livia, for joining us from Switzerland and for your um, kind words. And you've said it, so let's get into what we've actually been working on. There is an introduction planned by me, just for those who maybe have never really um, encountered the work of the PE. So, first of all, what is the PE? Just shortly, we've been launched in 2020, as Livia has said. We have several goals that we want to pursue with this network, but one of the main goals or the main goal for this year is the creation of a report that contains concrete, actionable policy recommendations. So, this is what we've been working on for the last a couple of months. And maybe just to show you or give you some statistics, uh, since obviously I'm a researcher so it's always nice to have some numbers um, and I think one of the most impressive numbers is that we've met over 65 uh, times in 2021 over all of the work streams so that's quite a number I think and just shows the enthusiasm and also dedication of these members who all dedicated their time um, for free. We have over 87 individual participants over all sessions so there's many more if you count the several attendances of people, but these are just individual people who've contributed to, um, who've attended and contributed to our p &E sessions or p &E meetings. And so far we have over 27, 600,000 words written, which obviously is just quantity and we're also aiming for quality, but at the same time I think it's just nice to show that there has been a lot of work done and obviously we hope that you can convince yourselves of the quality of it as well. And finally, we've had three guest speakers that we had the pleasure to welcome and a gender distribution that was more or less equal or maybe a bit less equal, but at least um, there have been quite a number of female participants as well, which is always nice, I think, in these types of um, meetings. So here is just uh, to, to show you that we have a really nice website of the um, p and &E that you are welcome to consult if you want to know more. If you want to read more, we have an FAQ page, so we might not be able to answer all of the questions you might have. And on that page, you can also find further uh, reading that has been compiled also by external sources for which we are really grateful and um, all of the um, p and &E meeting documentation. So about the report, how is the report structured that we've been working on? So there is a chapter that contains introduction and scope of work. So what is within our scope, what's not within our scope. We have also decided to create a chapter that really is an overview of the challenges and risks associated with digitalization for the environment. So to really give a chapter for people who are new to this topic and who just want to get into the different challenges and risks associated. And then at the heart of the report, obviously, are the thematic chapters where we have the policy recommendations that we've chosen to formulate or propose on four different thematic areas. Obviously, there are many more areas that we could have explored, we could have structured them differently, but we had to make a decision at some point, and that's what we decided for to start off. So we have a section on or a chapter on environmental data. We have a chapter on food and water si um, systems. We have a chapter on supply chain transparency and circularity. And we have a chapter on overarching issues. So to give us the opportunity to address issues that might not be as directly linked to environment and digitalization, but are still, in our view, important to consider when formulating uh, policies. So before getting into the first chapter on environmental data and before I give the floor over to our workstream um, moderators, I just want to show you this as a, an illustration to maybe also make it more clear what the focus of our recommendations is because obviously sustainability has many different facets to it and different dimensions that we could address and that are equally important. But in this report, we've decided to focus on the environmental dimension of sustainability. So if you look at this diagram, that's 
dots or where the arrow points. So this is where um, we have decided to focus and we have two different angles that we have been discussing. So one, the kind of use of ICT for sustainability. So how can we use digital tools and digital technologies to achieve environmental sustainability? And two, the sustainability of ICTs themselves. So the huge concerns and uh, challenges that we are met with um, by the development of digital tools and digitalization processes themselves. And furthermore, to maybe manage your expectations a little bit also with regard to the recommendations, to maybe give you hopefully some context on what we were thinking when formulating these recommendations is also to say that obviously when you have a given policy recommendation there can be many or there are many different aspects to a, a policy and um, starting at the environmental policy objective dimension which would be at the top so really like a high level what is the objective of a policy and then there are other elements such as what is the action that is being taken what is the specific instrument that we want to use for a policy who is the target of a policy and who is finally responsible or who is the policy owner, so to say. And all of these elements are really important when developing a, a policy, but obviously given the scope of our work and our resources at hand, we couldn't address all of them. So in a way, when you look at the recommendations that we are presenting to you, maybe try to think of them as really being associated with that environmental policy objective. So really this high level idea of where do we want to go? Where do we think we should go with in the um, policy recommendation development? And then obviously all of the above or below um, policy elements are equally important and need to be addressed and could be one of the um, things we could address within the PE network or together with other actors as next steps. So to really continue and think about, and we can discuss this with you as well, and we look forward to hearing your ideas, which instruments could be useful to apply these policies that we um, recommend. So now there is the first chapter that we uh, want to present to you. So the first set of recommendations with regard to environmental data. And we have Jesse Oliver here with us today who has gracefully agreed to join us even in the middle of the night in Australia. So thanks a lot for being here. Jesse, over to you. No problem. It's my pleasure. I do need to warn you, we have a massive storm going on outside with massive lightning and thunder and everything else. So hope I don't lose power, but here we are. So I will give a quick and dirty overview of the main recommendations and then kind of give some nuanced details on each one. So we had a lot of really intensive and awesome discussions with a lot of really big movers and shakers in the space. And we decided there are three main things we wanted to focus on at this stage. And there is a lot of environmental data out there. We need to figure out how to standardize, but also harmonize existing data sets into those standards so that they can be readily used. And then we also need to make sure that that data is accessible and not just in the sense of making sure it's online and findable by those FAIR principles, but also thinking in more in-depth ways about care principles and making sure that Indigenous communities and local communities are considered in the way that governance is structured. And then increasing cooperation to maximize the impact of that environmental information through digitization. Next slide, please. Yep. Okay, so to get into that standardization and harmonization aspect, we're proposing to establish some global standards. So there's already some for biodiversity and different things like that, but kind of coalescing them and bringing them together in different ways and ensuring that they're strongly guided by data governance through the FAIR and CARE principles. If you're not super familiar with those, they're well worth a good read because they're quite useful in thinking about not only the digital infrastructure and technology considerations for creating standards, but also the human component and ethics of making sure that the data is represented in a way that is responsible for diverse communities. And then also processing should be inclusive, the process. So ensuring that we include all the different stakeholders that we're hoping to target in the conversation from the very get-go with multiple stakeholders. So recommendation two. Over to you. 
Thank you. Uh, and this is ensuring, again, that it's accessible, but thinking in a much broader way than is often talk, talked about with that standardization and the FAIR principles. Also thinking about the information in terms of, are they going to be able to interpret the information that has been analyzed and that making sense of that actual environmental data? We want to make sure that there's knowledge exchange and equity in knowledge. So being able to ensure that people that may not have the knowledge can gain access to information to maybe understand more complex concepts and thinking about being very transparent about all the different processes involved in environmental data from collection to analysis to dissemination and thinking about conveying and tailoring information both for broad use but not forgetting the particular audiences and how they actually need to understand and digest and use that information. So thinking a lot about tech design and thinking about how are creative ways that we can elicit and understand the needs of diverse communities. All right, next one. Yep, so recommendation three, this is one that I'm super passionate about too, uh, because I really believe that we can do so much for collaboration if we maximize the impact with digitizing information through mechanisms of including the public in a lot of these processes. And if we think about things like the sustainable development goals, there's already been a lot of work exploring how the public through citizen science and other open science mechanisms can contribute to things like the sustainable development goals. And we also are looking at broader types of collaboration between you know, industry, NGO, and all the different sectors that this information actually can impact and influence to inspire change and building capacity for underserved and underrepresented communities as well. And making sure again, that we're super accountable and transparent in all of the process as to even how we tried to ensure uh, to be inclusive and, and be receptive to input from that process, because we also need to continually evaluate and iterate how we do things as we learn. And I think that's it for me. Thank you very much, Jesse, for that overview. Yep. And Jesse is working for the Australian Citizen Science Association, which I forgot to say before. So for anyone who wants to reach out to Jesse, um, that's where her main expertise, among other, lies. So I'm hoping that's okay, <laughs> Jesse, that <laughs> you might get Yeah, emails. I'm also a tech design researcher professionally as well. Thank you very much. So now our second on to our second chapter, which is the food and water systems chapter. And for this, we are very lucky that we have David actually on site here with us today. So thank you very much, David, and over to you. Um, thank you, Florina, and thank you um, for, for the invitation to be here. Um, it's, it's a great place to be. Uh, I've learned tremendously a lot about the, throughout the whole week. Um, first of all, I want to say a lot of thanks to all my uh, co-authors in this chapter who cannot be here today, but who hopefully are online or may not because we are also distributed widely uh, in terms of time zones. So some are in British Columbia and it might be a little bit too early for them. Uh, so thanks, thanks to all of you. In the food and water system chapter, um, yeah, I mean, we have tried to distill um, what digitalization actually can contribute here. And just a reminder that, that food, access to food and clean water is actually a human right. Um, but still, um, yet today, 800 million people are facing hunger and 12% of the population live in food insecurity. Um, and as you all know, we, we are facing a future in which um, the population will continue to grow and environmental st and climate stresses will become higher. So the, the impact on the food system or the, the requirements for the food systems um, and also the water systems to get much more efficient are absolutely crucial. So as one part, of course, like with digitalization, 
like it's not the golden bullet here, so we cannot like change, transform, or use it to transform the whole system. But it's it can be one very powerful tool in a in a in a toolbox, um, and um, thus we have framed five policy recommendations that we hope help to achieve that or to help in to stimulate policymakers all around the world to think how they can probably approach um, digitalizing their food and water system. The first recommendation is, um, and that's probably more a reminder than a recommendation, it's more like a preambular text or preambular recommendation that digitalization in food systems should always be applied with contextual specificity and sensitivity. Um, what did we want to say with that? Um, it is important that sometimes when you when you come probably from an ICT sector um, or from, from, from one of the bigger vendors, you develop a solution, right? And the solution needs then to fit as many use cases as possible. Um, and But we need to understand that food and water system are very vulnerable and very specific and locally um, context-specific systems. So um, it's difficult to come in with solutions that and just paint with a like broad brush over it and say this is the solution you need to use from now on. So it's a reminder for policymakers that when um, these kind of strategies or tools, uh, anything is being put in place in order to help make um, the systems future proof that they need to be very careful of the context and not try to improve something that's probably already working pretty fine through local indigenous knowledge um, and through, through the knowledge of people who have been working with these systems or in these systems for a long time already. The second recommendation is to increase capacities for the use of space-derived data for ensuring local food and water security. So um, there is, there is, um, there is. I, when I go to conference, I'm always being shown like this great Earth observation applications. There's always like, um, uh, like some kind of um, trick to it because either they're like predefined solutions and say they they serve one use case, so they're like adaptability is not that high, or you get amazing data output, but then you need to use that data yourself. So as an example, the EU Copernicus program. Um, and that is always an issue um, like that when you go to countries that actually would benefit from this, um, from this information the most, have the least capacity to absorb that and to use it and tailor it to their local needs. So this recommendation is actually reminding policymakers about like when you want to actually get good, make good use of earth observation data. And I mean, we had a citizen scientist beforehand that of course always needs to complement earth observation data. Um, that that like, they always need to think of where that capacity com comes from. The third recommendation is to preparing national and regional plans and strategies to use digital tools for the optimization of inefficient water systems. And that is particularly in developing countries. And that sounds maybe sounds a little bit counterintuitive, um, but um, when you think about water systems, they're normally, um, of course, like look differently um, all over the world, and they definitely look different in the global north and in the global south. But oftentimes, their systems, water systems, they're, they are there to stay for a long time. Um, or they're being built up newly for um, e.g. Uh, like in, in, in developing countries when you like there is there is some kind of infrastructure investment. So um, studies have found that actually the investment in digitalization is like brings the highest efficiency yields in terms of how water is used um, and collected um, um, and used and also the data that is collected to, to bring more efficiency to the system when systems are inefficient. So um, that the definitely in developing countries it would bring like in we are painting here with a broad brush um, but you know, that can can should be considered and could bring high efficiency gains the fourth one is to develop and adopt 
tools and processes that reduce inefficiencies, including in land use, especially for food systems. So when you think about that food systems, um, that, that the whole food system is responsible for about 33% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and that uh, I don't have the exact number for, um, for the amount of food waste or the share of food waste, from each of the um, uh, for, from for for the, from the global food system, it's important that when we are when we're looking at the challenges that we are facing, that we improve the efficiency along the whole um, production, um, transport, and uh, consumption um, chain. Um, so, in these recommendations, we are alluding a little bit to what needs to be done here in terms of reducing that inefficiencies and how, ca how digitalization can play a major role in that one. And the last one is one that is, I think, particularly important when you look at recent cases, um, especially uh, from, um, also from that very much from, the, uh, from, from developed nations where um, systems, especially water systems, have been held like hostage um, because their cybersecurity was not not up-to-date. And um, understanding that cybersecurity, maybe here there is a high awareness, but when you talk to uh, policymakers, um, they, fan, they, they, they appreciate the fancy solution and a little bit less like how to make it secure and how, how you know, like to, to get the investment in that. Um, so this is a reminder that this is an absolute crucial part because, I mean, your, your water system um, is, is, is a vulnerable, critical infrastructure. Um, and, and if you have like, bigger structures around a food system, it is as well. So um, an important note to keep that in mind. I just want to close with um, saying, okay, that this is, has come from the, from the or the, this work has been like um, very, interesting and collaborative. So uh, we had a lot of different expertises in the group and we have tried to look at the issue from a lot of angles. But of course it's not exhaustive, it's just five, a snapshot of five things that we thought would be valuable for, for as a policy recommendation. But there can be many more and um, having said that, I want to thank the, um, the IGF um, and also the Swiss government who I just heard gave the seed funding for this. Um, to, um, for the space because um, we as UN Climate Change, we are, we are, of course, we are trying to reach out and see, okay, what can other sectors bring, uh, or other, um, other organizations, other community bring in terms of solutions to, to the issues of both climate change adaptation and mitigation. So yeah, we are looking forward um, to how the PNE will further evolve and um, I'm looking forward to the finalized report. Thank you, Florina, over to you. Thank you very much, David, for that um, comprehensive overview. And David is joining us from UNFCCC. So as he has, um, he's an expert on climate change and climate adaptation. So that's just to complement the picture. And thank you for leading the work stream. So now we have our third chapter on supply chain and circularity, where we've interrogated ourselves, how can we make or use the supply chain and make it more circular and transparent? And we have two of the co-authors workstream leads here with us today. It's Leandro Navarro from UPC and Chris IP, uh, Ip from ITU. So over to the both of you. I don't know who wants to start. Yeah, we'll start. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you, um, IGF. Thank you all of the organizers for bringing us the opportunity to work on this report. You know, it's, it's not about contributing, it's about how much we can learn from, from being in the process. And that was been uh, amazing. And, uh, and thank you also for the amazing authors who have put together this uh, chapter. Um, so, you know, uh, when we talk about supply chain transparency and circularity, um, in, the, in the domain of digital technology or in, in any human activity, we tend to add new layers and uh, every layer adds a bit of uh, environmental impact. So it's very difficult to, to come up with solutions that uh, somehow decrease uh, the, the sum of all the uh, additions we, we make in, in, in the world. But, but so in a way, it's, it's human. ICT is part of the environmental problem. But also um, the ICT part, the digitalization, the uh, digital transformation can bring solutions. And these solutions have to be um, 
really effective. That's, I think, the added value of the word transformation, digital transformation, because we have to enable at some point that uh, processes become much more efficient. Um, and then uh, regarding the recommendations, we, we, we selected four, um, which cover different aspects. One is about the environmental efficiency of the digital technology itself, because we think in bits, but be, below the bits or supporting the bits, there's a lot of material, a lot of cables on land, uh, on, on the seas, uh, antennas and routers and servers and so forth and energy. So we have to make sure that the digital technology is not uh, part of the problem uh, by, by certain measures. Uh, the second recommendation was about um, how to bring transformation, this digital transformation to all supply chains uh, for any uh, sector, um, because it, it might really uh, save a lot by digitalizing their processes. Um, and, um, and then going back again to the ICT sector, uh, we need to make sure that um, it's not only that the, the uh, ICT elements are efficient, but also they have to be used uh, smart. And that means uh, extending the lifespan as much as possible and making sure that they do not pollute the, uh, the environment at any of the phases. And finally, uh, we, are, uh, we are all uh, together, let's say, but only those who can afford, only those who have connectivity, only those who have um, resources to transform their uh, processes and well, we could apply it to everything, but let's at least focus on the ICT part, uh, repair, recycling, e-waste management, uh, different aspects that require uh, support and require funds and require expertise to be implemented, especially in the, in the lower middle income countries. So if we go to the first um, recommendation, um, yeah, regarding the maximizing the environmental efficiency of digital technology, uh, well, um, of course, it can be done by improving each process individually. But um, apart from that, apart from eco design, apart from due diligence when we procure or buy uh, devices, um, about care on knowing and keeping devices on track, um, and that we have the information uh, to, to do a waste processing in the most optimal way, that results into, into knowing details, into uh, sharing data that allows these processes to happen, how to repair, how to re how to choose the product in initially, how to refurbish it, how to uh, recycle it according to the materials and the, and the, and the way it was built. And uh, the digitalization of this uh, chain of custody, uh, all these parts um, for all the processes that, that involve the lifespan of a device, uh, there is a concept that is called the digital, digital product passport that is a, a, a way to put together all this information so that every process, every participant has the, the right information for anything. And then, of course, that implies as well that all this digital information can be used to implement policies, methods, incentives to, to make sure that all together we, we choose, we, we, we make sure that um, Technology is it's, uh, it's as efficient as possible, and, and, and we promote that uh, as hard as we can. And then moving to the second recommendation. Um, yeah, as I said, it's, it's not only the effect on the ICT sector, but also the effect on every sector. Uh, digitalization can bring a lot of benefits for what we call the forward, I mean, the manufacturing supply chains, but also the, uh, what happens after the initial use, um, how these um, devices that are built can be used, reused, repaired, um, re dismantled into pieces, reuse the pieces, um, decompose into secondary raw materials, and finally uh, um, somehow dealt with in landfills or whatever, minimizing the, the impact. And for that, we need knowledge and we need to um, have responsibility in every step. And for this responsibility, we need like, um, I mean, transparency I and mean, clarity about details. We need traceability. We need to be able to know what, what happened with this device uh, when it was manufactured before us and what will happen or, I mean, after a certain time, what happened with a device that passed through our hands. And we have to make sure that this is uh, done in the right way. 
We need to ensure interoperability and automation because there are uh, sectorial solutions, but they need to be integrated all together really to give us a, a complete view of, uh, of uh, what we are doing. And, and we we'll linked data, semantic data, blockchain technology, AI, machine learning um, are technologies that are promising to be part of the solution, although, although sometimes they are part of the problem. And then, well, for interoperability, for, for um, all these uh, objectives, we need international standards. We need to agree on, on how to implement that, that interoperability. We need rules that promote those uh, mechanisms. And we need ways to uh, scale up and adopt these uh, solutions, which means piloting, uh, development, uh, support for digitalization of all these processes um, in all supply chains. And then if we move to the third uh, recommendation, Chris can, can explain that one. Um, thank you, Leandro. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, <clears throat> for policy recommend, uh, recommended, recommendation number three, uh, we really wanna emphasize on um, the role of international, international standards uh, when it comes to implementing circularity. Uh, just um, ICTs can be designed for recyclability, repairability, and among other um, circular principles. We've also discussed how, um, for example, um, extended producer resp uh, responsibility policy can be, uh, can, can be used to improve um, end of life management uh, of different ICT uh, products and equipment. So I think we can all agree that these are very important qualities that can help to improve um, the environment. But, um, it was very important that in our chapter, oh, sorry, I probably just my internet, Ho hopefully uh, it is working a little bit better right now. Um, I'll just keep going for it. But yeah, so with that in mind, we thought it was very important that in our chapter, um, there needs to be a policy recommendation that can provide um, concrete means uh, for people to take action and support uh, the implementation of circularity in uh, the ICT, ICT supply chain. And that is what this particular recommendation is about. Uh, international standard, they are very practical tools that uh, contain guidelines and uh, recommendations that anyone can use uh, to improve uh, circularity. And in our chapter, we actually, uh, we actually look at a couple of examples. Um, one of them is, uh, one of them, one of them is uh, called recommendation ITUT L.1023. And what, what this standard does is that it provides a methodology for assessing the level of circularity in ICT goods uh, based on a, circle, a scoring system. And the benefit of using this standard is that um, product designers, they can use this to determine the level of circularity of the design. And with that information, they will be able to improve the design. Uh, at the um, very early stage of the um, ICT lifecycle. The standard provides guidance for um, policymaker to implement an EPR system, uh, extended producer respons uh, responsibility system, and enhance the um, enterprise management of ICTs. Uh, just very quickly, I also, I, also uh, I also want to mention another standard that I believe is not on the slide, but is in the chapter. Uh, which is um, L.1470. And this particular standard provides a guidance um, specifically for the ICT sector to set emission uh, reduction trajectory that is in line with um, the climate targets set in Paris Agreement. And the emission reduction target contained under developed specifically for the ICT industry and they're approved by the science-based target initiative. So send, send it like this one, it can, uh, it can really help uh, provide the exact tools uh, the sector needed to uh, set a clear pathway to reach net zero. And you can learn more about this standard in our chapter. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Leandro. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And then uh, the fourth recommendation and the last one is that, I mean, we, we, can, we can agree on, on sharing uh, the, the best ways of doing things here, as Sanders proposed, but, um, but sometimes we don't have the resources to implement it. So I think it's very important to have this recommendation that says that, well, we need to uh, make sure that there is there are funds, there is knowledge that should be uh, available 
to help those who need also to take tackle the challenges and, and upgrade all their uh, um, steps in the ICT uh, supply and reverse supply chain. Otherwise, we will just we'll know how to do it, but we won't do it. And then um, uh, th there are there's a list here about uh, the different elements that that need to be uh, addressed, like for instance, e-waste uh, dumping grounds or uh, how to integrate informal repair uh, in, in the formal uh, process or, or give them the opportunity to really contribute to the, to the climate uh, uh, protection, to the environment protection. Um, we have to, we have, we see needs for better operations, better equipment for, the, for informal workers that in, in low and middle income uh, countries do a, a major part of the, of the, the dirty work in the circular economy. Uh, we need credit finance for for investments because they, they they are desperately needed. We need help to uh, pre, to to develop uh, legislation in different regions to protect them and protect them from from abuse from outside and also from abuse from inside. Um, we need to wait, have ways to enforce those legislations. It's not enough to to write it; it has to work. And um, we have to find local ways of doing things because the, the models that work in rich economies might not translate well in others. And um, and we need capacity building. We need uh, institutions uh, to to know what how to do what to do and uh, develop this knowledge with them, not just for them. And and as a final summary of all the recommendations, next slide shows like a, an image of uh, what are the four let's say scopes we 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 look at is digital technology as it is supply chain all supply chains developing countries and we would love to maximize the efficiency of one introduce circularity in the other help in digital transformation of all supply chains and support developing countries to to tackle those change challenges and well not only countries but also communities and uh, because it's um, it's a global problem and that's that's all regarding the supply chain transparency and security. Thank you so much for bringing us to to this point. Thank you very much, Leandro and Chris. It was a real pleasure to work with you on that chapter, and I really like the friendly illustration that you provided in the slides, even though it's a serious topic. So thanks a lot. And um, maybe for those who just joined us, we, as a recap, so we've heard the recommendations on environmental data, food and water systems, and now supply chain and circularity. And in the Zoom chat, there is now also the link to this presentation. So feel free to check that out if you want to um, scroll back or skip uh, something and for your future reference. Maybe for those who have been asking in the chat, so we haven't, or I have kind of made the executive decision to not share the whole report with everyone at this point just because uh, we are still working on it and want to provide a full draft or a, it, at some point it just gets a bit messy for co-authors if there's a lot of input uh, coming in but if there are people um, or participants here who would really like to give an additional feedback and who have specialized experience in one of the chapters then please reach out to me or any of us and um, our contacts are provided in the presentation and also on the PE side which I've linked in the presentation and I'm sure we'll find a way to um, include you in the final sprint. But just um, I hope that you um, can understand this uh, process of work. So, um, but yeah, feel free to, to check out this presentation we're currently on. So that will for sure give you already quite some information. And now we have a final chapter um, to present to you on overarching issues for which we have Florian Cortes, who is joining us also from uh, the Netherlands to present this chapter. Florian, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, joining from rainy Holland, but I'm a Brazilian national. And I will talk about the overarching issues that are connected to governance aspects. And like in that sense, they uh, touch upon all of the domains or across the domains. So it is a broader take. That has uh, uh, that talks about the governance issues related to environmental policy making, and how uh, digitalization can be an asset here. And the three recommendations refer first to increasing inclusivity, so that's basically access to the online environment for more individuals more equitably. Second, 
to uh, uh, use, uh, rely on evidence-based uh, decision-making. So to have the data that is uh, obtained via sense-making uh, uh, and also make in, uh, that uh, the policy level is informed by this type of data and not only private organizations, but also that it can guide uh, better policy making. And third, uh, uh, we also recommend to uh, explore participatory e-democracy approaches uh, that can also be important for uh, citizen buy-in for the type of environmental reforms that will be needed going forward. Now I will look at each one of those uh, separately a bit uh, in more detail. So re regarding inclusivity, so it is just released uh, by the ITU that still one uh, more than one third of the world's population can't access the internet. So we have a problem of inclusivity and access. And uh, the idea here is to, uh, we recommend increasing access and thinking of that in individual community and country level. And uh, not only access is important, but also uh, digital literacy to make the most of access. Another uh, point that we emphasize is that the digital infrastructure uh, is designed in a way that allows uh, uh, a broad uh, participation. So uh, relying on open source, for example, and providing this infrastructure that is accessible uh, more freely. And we encourage also uh, more developed countries to help building uh, these digital capacities more broadly around the world and to strengthen uh, these uh, individual institutional and societal levels of access uh, via research on uh, uh, the capabilities that are needed in terms of infrastructure, but also capacity building for uh, the individual level, for example. If we come to recommendation number two, which is to rely on evidence for policymakers uh, and uh, do that in a better way. So, uh, so we should invest in this like data collection, also especially environmental data collection that can be helpful to guide environmental policy uh, going forward. And uh, and this is important also because objective data is important to guide uh, policy making in uh, times where uh, it can be um, polarized environments and uh, to uh, make uh, the uh, obtaining of data a transparent process can maybe tip the tide in favor of a more informed policy making process. And then policy makers should also uh, invest in uh, creating leading and uh, lagging indicators to guide uh, environmental policy making process going forward and to help with uh, policy implementation where uh, the lagging indicators are important to review what worked and what didn't work and benchmark indicators are also important to uh, facilitate that different governance units different uh, communities or provinces can uh, compare their efforts. And uh, so to avoid also free riding by, uh, and that encourage uh, that all uh, governance units uh, feel that uh, they are, everyone is doing their fair share and achieving certain targets. With that, we can come to the third and last recommendation on, the, on this governance uh, angle. So here, uh, think of the keywords uh, e-participation and e-democracy and how to, uh, via uh, technology, encourage uh, remote participation, remote voting that is safe enough. And we want to uh, encourage that more diverse stakeholders can then uh, engage in the political process to counterbalance interests that are uh, blocking uh, decisive environmental reform. And here 
uh, this uh, relates very strongly to the first uh, issue of inclusivity. Because if you try to uh, try out uh, e-participation, but people don't have internet access, that just reproduces inequities. So it's important to think of these recommend uh, recommendations jointly. If not, uh, you might not have the desired outcome. So, uh, and then with uh, this type of e-participation uh, performance monitoring of what the policymakers are trying in the environmental field becomes uh, possible. Citizen feedback loops can uh, be uh, implemented. And basically, it's a, that's also important to check on what the politicians are doing to increase accountability of policymakers, because otherwise they get uh, uh, they can be the, um, influenced by vested interests that have a different type of privilege access in the political process. So these uh, uh, tools for uh, e-participation can also help with a couple of other objectives that are important for the environmental policy field. So to uh, better allocate the environmental investments according to what the local context asks for. And uh, like that, maybe also at the local level, the abatement uh, uh, costs can be considered. So because citizens know uh, where their taxpayer money will have the biggest effect in terms of reducing the environmental uh, negative externalities. And then also uh, encouraging e-participation, you can identify where capacity building needs to be targeted at. So every uh, uh, governance unit uh, might have different needs. And so if uh, the government, the national government or an international NGO wants to assist in capacity building, it needs to be according to the local needs and uh, to, uh, digital tools to survey uh, what needs uh, exist are important here. Then via e-participation, uh, we think also about participatory budgeting where uh, to uh, have uh, assemblies uh, held where you can prepare holding meetings online and increase uh, uh, the incentives to participate by making it less costly to attend to such political events is important for increasing the communication among citizens. And that ultimately maybe builds trust uh, that is needed for this type of environmental reforms that will be ne uh, needed to face the climate uh, challenges that we are facing. And then exchange of information across governance units, of course, remains imp uh, important. So to uh, keep it uh, tailored to the local level, but via uh, digital communication and via uh, data sharing and benchmarks to have also the overall uh, uh, policy targets of uh, the higher level governance units uh, accounted for. So with that, we still have a last slide uh, where uh, we try to uh, uh, make sense of these different facets of the governance angle. And since they kind of feed into each other, it's important to look at them uh, in uh, conjunction with each other so that uh, the overall uh, outcome can be achieved properly. Thank you so much. And uh, the work I have to uh, thank also to uh, Peter and Florina especially and the other contributors to this chapter. And I'm reflecting the joint work uh, of uh, all of us who've been talking on these issues. Thank you so much, Florian. Thanks also for the last slide. I think visuals are always helpful. And with that, we're actually at the end of the presentation, of the formal presentation of what we have been thinking about in these chapters. And obviously now the main part would be that we are very much looking forward to hearing your inputs and your feedback. So I've just prepared um, maybe a couple of questions. So what do we expect from you or what would we, we be grateful for in terms of feedback? Because it's not the same, or as I've mentioned, we're in the final stages of drafting the support. So there's specific feedback that will be helpful to us. So for example, 
just whether the recommendations make sense to you in the sense that you understand what they're meaning to say, where could the thought process maybe be clarified, Is, are there elements that you um, wish to be strengthened or um, just explained differently and do you have maybe important resources you would like to share with us that's maybe a bit easier in the chat function, we will be uh, safeguarded so for the about 50 people in the chat feel free to share with us resources that pertain to the chapters we've presented that would be really helpful we are also including case studies so if you know of interesting case studies that could be helpful don't hesitate to also um, let us know about them and then also for the people in the room we are also looking for a dialogue with you so feel free to make comments in general on which aspects might be particularly important to you or how could these recommendations be applied in your specific contexts. I will just show on the next slide an overview of all of the recommendations again, so for your reference, but really so just to kind of for clarification that these kind of comments maybe won't necessarily make it into the report at this stage, but we will take them up for further dialogue and for further work with the p &E. But the specific feedback, we really welcome also to be able to put it in, um, integrate it into the final round of revision of the report. So with that said, here is the overview of the different, um, all of the recommendations. Obviously, it might be hard to read from very afar, so feel free to come closer for the people in the room with us. Um, for the people at home in front of their screens, it might be easier um, to scroll in and out. You have the access to the presentation in your Zoom chat. So with that said, um, now the open discussion round is um, open, so we have a microphone that can go around in this room. We have about, I would say, 30 participants in here and another 50 in the Zoom chat. So we might just start with the Zoom because I've seen that there are already quite a few comments. Um, so we might just ask someone to break the ice and that someone would probably be Horst if he's still here because he's quite the active contributor and I know that he doesn't mind uh, taking the floor. So Horst, would you mind if I give over to you because I know that you've made quite some comments during that time. All of the others could maybe think about what uh, they would like to add, which could be helpful to us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Florina, uh, for giving me the chance to, I, I, I think I don't have to, to mention too much. Uh, I, I made uh, quite some remarks for, uh, and uh, recommendations for, for maybe the, the one or the other point, uh, um, especially for me is uh, the, the problems of, uh, to, to make, to make the, the, uh, the problem case not on standard um, proce uh, procedures of everything needs to be interoperable. Ever this is not really new to to a lot of people, but the situation in certain at at at, at least to to explain um, with uh, certain um, scenarios um, that would be why it is important there and what does it mean in improving governance there in this scenario which is suboptimal some in some places in our world it's disastrous these things how that helps in disaster where, where governance is a little bit different uh required than in general case then uh, you see these these things uh, certainly would be nice to to have included a little bit. Maybe of course other. I, I took the Amazon basin, which is not only Brazil. All the other neighboring states have parts of the Amazon basin, uh, as it is called, the larger area. And uh, what is happening there is so much a disaster, which every one of us knows. Those who don't. Please look into Amazon Basin environmental disasters, and you find certainly uh, a lot of information there. And uh, there are other uh, situations in our world where we can exemplify on the desperate need of these things that we are calling for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Horst. So if I understood you correctly, you are maybe wishing for a more specific focus for maybe another type of um, output document where we could more detail, go more into more detail on what these recommendations could be, could look like implemented to a specific context. That's right. Thanks a lot. Is there anyone who wants to add to what Horst has just said or bring something else up? 
you can raise your hand in the chat function or raise your hand here in the audience. We can clearly see you, so don't be shy. Yes, there is someone in the audience. The microphone is coming. Thank you. I'm Mohamed Kamara from Liberia. And uh, in the other session, I just came to join the session. And I listened to the presentation, which are especially when it comes to the policy area, the to do environmental activity and other activity that I think all of speakers mentioned about e-participation and inclusiveness when it comes to the uh, internet. So I was a little, and I mentioned about how best people can form part of the chat room, I wish I want to form part of the chat room. I have interest in that, in that area. And the, the, the resources, the material, how we can get access to the material, so we can to make our input, especially I want to make, uh, make input into that material. So the issue how to do with environmental, especially e-waste area, is very key when it comes to technology, because every now and then people are engaged and technology network users are expanding and a lot of new things coming in the world. So definitely to manage the e-way if you are not careful in the future, our life will be affected. So one of the areas we're gonna look at, and you look at most of the elite development country, policy in those areas are not yet developed by some other country. I think we rec I would recommend that, that some of the areas you should how to help other country, elite development country can develop policy and keep out of the building when it comes to e-way. If you look at most of the African areas, they have uh, uh, policy on all ways, but specifically e-ways is not captured in, in that aspect. I think we have to develop that, so I bet people, African country can have to develop policy and focus on e-ways. That would be the best. One of the recommendations, one of the things we can do in kind of the e-ways area, most often we develop day for those days where people can design program for their day. Who can get a specific day for e-waste day. That should be a national program for all government around the world to identify that it will be e-waste day. So ministry or agency responsible for policy area or stakeholder can develop program that kind of data e-waste day. Definitely will capture the attention of other stakeholders to come to that, cele to that, to that, to that celebration and uh, uh, have something to say. So that should be an annual event. Kopo or other things will help to, uh, to give more people the opportunity and leverage the, the, the spreading of the idea of e waste But when we keep it at that level, over any awareness, definitely for it to spread will be difficult. Most countries don't have it, we don't care, and it's affecting our life. People bury this thing in the future. We are federal, so we need more awareness when it comes to area e waste. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, if I've understood correctly, basically, essentially, you're really calling upon more action in the area of e waste, and maybe also you mentioned the national, like national programs that should be installed, and also this key issue of responsibility of on which we also touch upon in the report. So, the question of whether the problem of e waste is not also a problem of or a crisis of responsibility in the sense that people need to or companies might also have to take responsibility of the waste they are producing. But I'm looking forward to, I see that Leandro has raised his hands and I know that they have also thought about this question of e-waste in their discussions. Thank you. Um, yeah, in fact, I wanted to uh, reply to the previous two uh, comments. Um, E-waste is a huge problem, and it is reflected in the report. I and mean, we are talking about, about millions of tons of e-waste produced every year. We are talking about like uh, nearly 60 billion uh, US dollars per year of resources lost. Um, a lot of disasters in everywhere, and um, many countries in the world without uh, any policy which allows them, which prevents them from importing e-waste. Um, so, so it's a huge problem and it is covered and it deserves uh, all our, our, our attention. If you look at the, for instance, the Global E-Waste Monitor uh, from the UN, uh, they, they focus specifically on that. Um, but at the same time, um, um, this is the end of the, of the chain. 
but we have to make sure also that we do not produce uh, as much as we have been producing in the last years. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, things, devices are kept as resources for as long as possible, uh, delaying the arrival to this uh, uh, to e-waste processing. We have to um, make sure that devices are designed in a way that they are for durability and not for replacement, quick replacement, not for obsolescence. We need to make sure that in the materials are collected in, in a way that um, that come from from good, not only environmental, but also uh, working conditions in, in mining, which is also another disaster. And, and you know, uh, I think we try to cover everything, but as someone else said, uh, we can we did, we couldn't cover everything. We we have some um, things to do in the, in the coming years as well, um, and particularly um, you, when you read the document, when the document is available, uh, you might think that we are looking at it from a top level, top down perspective, which means that sometimes looks like we don't care about the details, but the details are there, and it would also be really important. And we discuss about um, collecting case studies because it's only there when you look at the problem from bottom up and from the I mean, it's only when we group that we can write about it, but it's only when we go into the details when, in addition to understand the problem, we can find uh, solutions for it because the problem is not is not for being studied; it's been for being uh, eradicated. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, thank you because all this feedback help us to really uh, plan about what to do next. Thank you a lot, Leandro. And I see that we have a question in the chat. So it's a question to the panelists. Have you specifically considered rebound effects and how to address them in your reports? So I don't know whether um, you can think about this, the workstream leads especially, because I guess that could be a topic in, in most uh, topic areas that we've addressed, but maybe for those who are not as familiar. So I would say in my own words that rebounds effects kind of relate to this mechanism we often observe when there is an increase in efficiency that then also leads to an increase in demand for a specific product or a service. So just to broadly... Uh, say uh, what what I would consider rebound effects to be, but maybe others um, disagree or others would would, would uh, amend this. So feel free to comment on that work stream leads and other participants, of course. Sorry, who are you wanting to speak to that? It's open, but feel free to, since you already have the microphone, feel free to speak. Oh, there's Ilias coming in. Hello, Ilias. <laughs> yes, hi. So nobody wants to take this one. So let me allow, allow me to say a couple of words. The digital solutions have positive effect, but within a frame of uh, boundary effects okay so for example let's take an example of uh, connected mobility so for example 5g will enable uh, uh, connected mobility so people can actually instead of buying cars take uh, services within a city center but there are conditions that we need to respect this kind of a sustainability by design from the beginning because if these cars are deployed in the city center and the ownership of a car by all the residents are anyway not dissented yeah, basically people buy cars anyway you don't gain as much second these cars that are ever moving tomorrow it'll be autonomous cars today they are just you know electric cars with the drivers if they cannibalize on the public transport you also not gaining much with respect to ben climate benefits and third, if these cars are start to be used, and that's the big rebound to transport objects instead of people. So imagine that you know you have a friend across the city that wants a bottle of wine because it's late and he you know doesn't want to go out, and you start sticking objects and little things in these cars, then you way out of any uh, kind of benefits that you wanted to gain by this connected mobility, and that's true for any digital solution so precision farming if we don't do it in a way that we respect a minimum principle of how many devices we need and how much connectivity we need for a given purpose then you will not achieve much and the rebound effects or even the 
you know, direct footprint of these digital solutions may be bigger than the benefits you want to achieve. So in the precision of farming, for example, you can go for it by trying to sell gadgets to every farmer, by GPS, by drones, by satellite connectivity, and by IoT and stick, you know, a lot of connected devices in the soil and on the plant. And you can just saturate the far, you know, farm, farming with the devices. It'll be hard. It'll be a hard time to really, you know, offset this with the gains on pesticides and fertilizer and water management. Instead, what you could do, another way to do it, is that the agricultural companies become service companies. They get fewer devices to service bigger fields and more fields, and they are incentivized by becoming a service company to minimize the pesticides and fertilizers and whatever agricultural products because they become cost to them. Huh? So there are many other examples. You can talk about manufacturing and talk about uh, efficiency, energy efficiency of buildings. We have to keep in mind that digital solutions can do mar marvelous things, but just deploying technology alone without kind of a boundary conditions to prevent rebound effect or direct footprint effect uh, will not do it. Maybe I can add to the re rebound effect uh, issue uh, one, one point. So if um, if uh, the carbon price of uh, the carbon price is increased over time incrementally, it would uh, uh, trickle down to uh, users. And so uh, in that sense, increasing efficiency will just keep the end user uh, spending constant. In that sense, that counteracts the rebound effect in the sense that um, uh, if we uh, acknowledge that we need to increase carbon prices. So uh, the overall use won't uh, increase as much due to efficiency gains because the price of the use increases according to the carbon price. So in that sense, uh, uh, that was just one comment regarding the, that that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Florina, and thanks a lot also to Ilias, who is joining us from the European Commission, where he's working also on matters such as the digital product passport. So it's been really helpful to having you on board, Ilias. Thanks a lot. And um, is there anyone else who wants to add on this issue of rebound effects? I'm sort of interested in asking a question relating to that based on what I heard, if that's okay. Um, I am curious though, how you localize that? How do you customize that in a way that I think what you guys are all talking about is absolutely awesome. And I'm thinking about the participatory side of it, making sure that whatever we're trying to promote is actually what communities need and are gonna utilize in an efficient way that makes sense? And how do you evaluate that? So I would take that from a tech design perspective, but I'm wondering if other people have other ideas that could be incorporated in recommendations for an approach to that that isn't just focused on industry. That's an interesting question. I also saw that Horst in the chat mentioned, like, will industry business take care? I don't, not exactly sure what he means, but I guess just the sense of, I think it's interesting to consider all different stakeholders. So obviously from a citizen yeah. science perspective, you're probably more focused on the citizens and on the civil participation. And obviously there's also private uh, public stakeholders um, involved. So I think that's an inter interesting question you're you're asking. So basically, w could we develop a recommendation that maybe targets the com like combating rebound effects, but from depending on who it's applied to, right? So do we target citizen involvement or? I'm thinking about the incentivization. What's the incentive, even if you are looking at industry, what's the incentive for them to not design for obsolescence? If they design for obsolescence, they can change things quickly and then we end up with lots of e-waste, but what's the incentive to not do that if people aren't buying product as much? So thinking about it from a consumer perspective, but also the industry perspective. 
if I may, one way to do it is you, if you move your business model from quantity driven business model to kind of, you know, the, the business models that we mostly know around, that means more devices you sell, more money you make. And if we move into service model, and then you have all the incentives to make sure that the, your consumers that are paying services for using for other things, but using your devices, keep those devices as long as possible because it's a cost to you for them to come and changing and repair it and refurbish it all the time. So you are incentivized to make sure that these things last because you make money on services, not on the devices. And that's true for any, uh, any sector. It's not only electronics. Huh? I think it would be really great if the UN could play a role in advocating for companies that do that, though, because oftentimes the way things that the electronics seem to be resourced, it's cheaper to just remake them almost than to do the service, depending on what the... It's the already service. happening in a way that uh, servers, so the bigger equipment, so for telecoms and for data centers, the servers are already on a model and many companies offer them as a leasing and they do three cycles of refurbishment. And in order for that to become a sustainable model for them, profitable, they actually the profit margin on a secondhand server is bigger than selling new one. So, and that could be done, we can trickle, you know, go down to kind of consumer electronics with this model as well. But at the moment, for, it just applies to the bigger equipment. David has also, I wanted to say something, I'm not sure whether his mic works. Can someone turn off David? Oh, you can use well, that Just one, one quick reaction to that. I mean, there is a model sure. that is uh, servitized that is very close to all of us. It's if we are connecting to the internet through, um, through a fixed line, then the router you are using, it's servitized. You pay for the service of connecting to the internet and the manufacturer is really interested that this router lasts as long as possible. They repair them, they pre-manufacture them and they give them, they give them to another customer when you, you leave. So, so they buy devices which are cheap, but also which are durable because of their business is, works much better. David is trying to say well, something. I just really is interesting because I just, as, as an example to the router scenario, I just was required to change my router and I asked them, what can I do with my old one? And they literally said, throw it away. And I was shocked because I live in Australia. Like what? You're doing this nationally. This is insane. And I was really disappointed and I wanted to know, and maybe you guys know, and this may be tangential, but as a recommendation, where do we go to find out what to do with this stuff if we really want to do the responsible thing and know that it will actually be recycled and it's not just greenwashing? Yeah, I think this microphone works. Excellent. Um, so I just wanted to come back probably and because I think we are very deep in a very specific discussion and I think one major discussion around the topic that we had like in terms of food and water systems is that also even going like one stage down because often like when we are talking about political decision making it's often a political decision making that XYZ technology should be applied because it sounds fancy. Um, and I think there is normally an inherent problem with that because if, for example, there is no, um, the, the, it, it hasn't been planned properly, there is no real connectivity at a certain point, or you know, like there, there, like IT systems are so complex, especially in developing countries, sometimes it can go wrong there. And then people come there with a predefined solution and say, this is a solution you, you need to use from now on. Whereas on the contrary, we do have sometimes um, we do have communities who know exactly what they need to do in terms of adapting also to climate change because they have different kind of data and they have experience. Um, so I think in, in the whole discussion, we can never forget that, you know, like, um, that we need to apply this tool smartly and they need to um, be used where they can be most efficient and in terms of like where can they actually add value. And I think there is a lot of um, problems with the rebound effect because 
solutions are implemented somewhere like where they don't fit properly, so there, there has not been the pro uh, proper use case. Um, it has not been centered. The, the problem solution is not the right one for what is actually being needed. I think that is something that we see everywhere, like that, is, that, a, that a technology is being introduced or an ICT solution is being introduced and it actually doesn't do what people expected it to do because there were some breaches um, in, the, in, 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 in yeah, defining the, the business requirements. So I think when thinking about like the rebound effects, it's very important to keep in mind like when do we need to go and when, when do we really need, where can this fancy new technologies really be applied to make an added, give an added value and um, where, it, where, where it's basically just adding uh, to the problem and then we say like if we have rebound effects we'll end up with a lot of um, trash um, that comes from ICT solutions and probably also some words to what Elias said I think if we are transforming to the server service um, uh, economy or service provider that of course is like one potential solution but it also has some kind of downsides of course when you look especially for to the global south um, service providers may come from the global north and then just put their like um, give their their services or offer their services um, we see that with global seed companies who give who, who not lease but I mean they 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 provide um, seeds to farmers um, they which they cannot use to re like to to reseed because you, know, you need to buy the new um, pack of seed so um, I think there are a lot of lot of things around it's a very complex discussion I think just alone on the food system, on the circular economy thing, we could spend, we could write a whole report that would be at least as long as the one we have put now. So I think we have started the thinking in a lot of uh, areas. Um, but I, uh, yeah, we, I, I think we had the discussion about the future of the PNE and the, um, yesterday also. Um, so yeah, there, there can be added a lot of depth to everything we have put in the, in the report. And I think that's, that's also needed. So looking forward to doing that. Thank you very much, David. And our co-chair, Daniel, who's just appeared on the screen, has made a valuable uh, comment in the chat that we should be mindful to encourage everyone to speak. So here, once again, please don't uh, be scared to, to raise your hand virtually or here in the audience. And on that note, we actually have a question in the audience. So I hope that the microphone can be uh, brought. <laughs> or is it not a question anymore? <laughs> Good, another one. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, so I, I do have a kind of a question comment uh, just for the sake of uh, the participation. My name is Raquel Gato. I'm the counterpart of Lurina for the Sister Policy Network on Meaningful Access. Uh, thank you very much first for the great panel. I've learned a lot, uh, to be honest. So if uh, your goal was to bring more people into the topic, I'm certainly more interested and more curious. But then I also saw a, a lot of um, synergy in particular with one of the discussions that we had, um, and we had our main session yesterday, uh, that for the fact that meaningful access mean different things for different people. And so for some, it's uh, their way of uh, education. Uh, for some, it's their way to communicate with their family. And for some, an emergency uh, in, in risky areas is a, an emergency lifeline. So, um, and by hearing the discussions now, um, I would uh, perhaps tease the, the panelists and the PE uh, to think if uh, one of the properties for meaningful access is also uh, environmental sustainability because I think this has not been raised uh, in, in previous discussion and it might be a cross pollinization between those policy networks. Thank you very much and you were very lucky to have uh, Florina, uh, my lucky counterpart. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much Raquel and I think it's a great suggestion to expand um, I think sometimes it has to be careful with expanding existing concepts, but we have encountered that struggle in the PNE report as well to be able to really define the different concept of sustainability and environmental sustainability, um, because those concepts can mean very different things in different uh, contexts. So thank you for that additional food for thought. And we have officially three minutes left. I know that we can go a bit over, but I just don't want to um, rush us. So if there's one or two final questions. I really encourage everyone and anyone um, to speak. 
if you are um, not encouraged to do so right now, you can always reach out to us um, via email. Please just bear in mind that if you want to make a contribution to the report or something that you really want us to take into account and do it as rapidly as possible, and if possible, with regard to these um, questions that we've specified here. So feel free to reach out to us anytime on these, on these issues. Of course. Thank you. Just very quickly a comment. Much of the discussion has been focused on, on tech-oriented solutions. They are very bad, they are needed, and uh, they may drive uh, much of the progress. But I also hope we can expand the scope of the discussion. Um, a lot of the technical solutions will not, unless there's a change in mindset, moving from a throwaway economy that our Australian colleague just mentioned to a shared economy. A lot of things can be shared without throwing them away and can still function. It's not a global phenomenon yet, but among a lot of local communities, Saturday is a share day where they bring products they no longer need, but then can to be used by others. It's growing a phenomenon and it can be applied to some of the issues we face now in order to help protect the environment. And it's, it's just a, a way for us to think outside of technology solutions and to see whether changes in mindset can advance the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much for that additional comment. And now I would invite da Daniel, excuse me, I'm getting confused with all the different uh, Daniel and Davids on this call, but I really want to um, introduce now officially our co-chair Daniel, who's with us on the call for the final parting and outlook words. Thank you very much for joining us, Daniel, from Microsoft. Thank you very much, Florina, and I will endeavor to be as concise in the time that we have to close, just to tell a bit of a story to everybody um, who's joining this session. As Florina mentioned, this was kicked off and launched last December at the IGF um, annual meeting. However, as a working group, as a multi-stakeholder working group, we only really came together for the first time on the 20th of April this year. And so in a couple of days, it will be eight months exactly that we have been functioning on a monthly basis since April and in other meetings. And I just think that we should take a moment and, and reflect on the fact that we are in a pandemic. We have many people in this multi-stakeholder working group across different geographies, different time zones. And in eight months, being able to pull together this initial report draft is really impressive and, and it's great thanks and testament to all the initiative and investment and time that has been provided. I think another point that I just want to share in this story of, of the group and its continuing evolution is we decided early on, back in April, I believe, that we wanted to make this really digestible and accessible to all audiences. We didn't want to write another very theoretical, academically intensive and wonkish report. We wanted something that would be easy for policymakers and wider audiences to take and digest. You'll notice that we have just three to four recommendations for each chapter. You'll notice that we arranged ourselves in chapters and themes that we felt were most pressing to the time and the topic. And we also took a perspective that it's not only looking at benefits and risks, it's looking at the continuum and the spectrum in between. And so I hope that you notice these uh, nuances and, and we plan to develop these further. One of the comments that we received in our wide consultation on the current draft in November and it's been echoed here again today by the gentleman who spoke about e-waste, is that we do need to have a developing country perspective in this report. There are many challenges and opportunities in the developing world at the intersection of the environment and technology. And we believe that this 
forum that the Internet Governance um, has put, Internet Governance Forum has put together, gives us a really meaningful and golden opportunity to address these challenges and opportunities to people who really need them, including in developing countries. So that's really a challenge to all the chapter leads, de facto chapter leads, to go over this and, and as we take this feedback, make sure that we are doing service to people who will benefit from this specialized knowledge. Another point that we talk about often as, as co-chairs, um, Prajemic and Katharina, is that we do want to have as many case studies as possible to make these theoretical ideas and exploratory ideas, because we're all still learning about this intersection, if we're honest. But we want to have as many case studies to make this real as, and meaningful um, for people to contextualize. And so I know that many of the private sector organizations represented here, IGF being a multi-stakeholder forum, have a wealth of case studies in specific areas where there is a specific solution. So I'm mindful that we're running out of time. I just want to say we'll continue to disseminate this. We're working very extensively with um, partners who can get the message out. The message has already gone out at the UN high level panel and we look forward to more opportunities to discuss and implement these ideas. So thank you all and um, pleasure to be here representing Microsoft and my other co-chairs. Thank you so much to everyone. I've been getting uh, really scared already because my experience here with these panels is that sometimes they just cut you off. So I didn't, didn't want this to happen to you, Daniel. So thanks a lot for um, your valuable remarks. And also, I think I put up the last slide. Just thank you, massive thank you to everyone who's contributed to the co-chairs, to the workstream leads, etc., and to the co-authors and reviewers as well. And to all of you for being here today, of course, in the plenary um, or on site or um, virtually on Zoom. And we really hope to be talking to you again very soon. Don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime you feel like it. And thank you to my panelists who've been here with me today. It was a pleasure. <laughs>